Welcome to episode 43 of Counterthought. I am very excited about this episode because in a few minutes I will be joined by Noelle Pullen to discuss Gen Z and the Republican Party. The end of this week is going to be April 1st, which means we will just be seven months away from the 2022 midterms. And what I want to look at and discuss here in this episode is Gen Z, the Republican Party, and where it stands today, and then what the Republican Party can do between now and voting day this year, and then obviously moving forward, eyeing 2024, to bring more of Gen Z into the Republican Party whether you are a conservative or just identify as a Republican. What can the Republican Party do to bring more of Gen Z into its party? Because Gen Z right now, if you didn't know, is anyone born between 1997 and 2012. So the oldest of Gen Z was able to vote in the 2016 election. And then more were able to vote in 2020 and it is obviously going to continue to grow as the generation gets older and more and more reach voting age. And in relation to the other generations that vote, Gen Y, millennials like myself, uh, Gen X, baby boomers, the I believe it's the silent generation. Baby boomers and the silent generation are going to be phasing out, right so it is up to Gen Z and Gen Y. They're going to be the largest voting blocks here in the next presidential election, and definitely by the presidential election after that. So some quick statistics for you about Gen Z. Gen Z, again, is anyone born between 1997 and 2012. Gen Z in the 2016 election only accounted for 4% of the votes cast. That number grew in 2020 to be 10% of the votes cast. Gen Z, however, only is made up by estimates 31% as Republicans. 31%, so that means there are 69% out there that is either registered Democrat or maybe independent maybe leaning more libertarian. In comparison to Gen Y, which is me, my generation, Gen Y is anyone that was born between 1981 and 1996. Gen Y, as a percentage of the total U.S. population, is 22%, which is 71 million people. Gen Z is 68 million people. 21% of the U.S. population. So very close. There's only 3 million difference between Gen Z and Gen Y. Gen Y, though, however, represents currently 21% of eligible voters of the 2020 election. Now, if you combine, as I was saying, Gen Z and Gen Y, you have 139 million people, 43% of the U.S. population. And then when it comes to voters, Gen Y and Gen Z equal 31% of eligible voters projected in this year's midterms in 2022. One thing I read also is that right now it seems that Gen Z is more progressive and they are pro-government. They want, they identify and support more of the progressive policies that we've seen, especially like from this current administration, and they support more involvement in our daily lives from the government, for the government to help solve today's problems instead of allowing individuals and private businesses to solve today's problems with the government, you know, I guess being involved in doing what they can here or there. Republicans, we don't want to rely on the government. We want as little government as possible. Democrats, progressives, not so much. They have shifted way left and want more government involvement. So how can we, as the Republican Party, how can the Republican Party take that 69% of Gen Zers and increase that 31% as Republicans and increase that closer to 50%, which would be more than the number of registered Republicans in the country at this time? I believe that is only around 
between 40 and 45 percent of all registered voters. So how can that be increased? I know there are some very uh, prominent organizations that are currently trying to make that happen. There is Turning Point USA, the president and founder, CEO, is Charlie Kirk and Turning Point USA. It is the largest and fastest growing conservative youth activist organization in the country. That is right from their website. That is how they identify, that is how they describe themselves. Turning Point USA, what they do is they are involved um, to educate students about fiscal responsibility, right? Finances, free markets, and living in government. And Turning Point USA is on about has about three thousand chapters, which means they are have chapters at different um, college campuses and high schools for a total of about two hundred fifty thousand student members. So that's great. Turning Point USA is doing fantastic work. Charlie Kirk, I think, on his podcast has like one of the top the top five podcasts, making. I'm just guessing here, but definitely making millions a year through Turning Point USA and is having great success. The numbers that they are showing year after year, quarter after quarter, continues to rise, which is very encouraging for Gen Z. And then there is also CPAC. CPAC is the Conservative Political Action Committee. They just had their one of their conferences here in Orlando last month. I did not get a chance to go, but all of the pictures I have seen, there are a lot of younger generation Gen Zers there at CPAC, which again is encouraging. Which brings me to my guest. I'll bring her on in just a second. Noelle Poland. She is currently studying to get a degree in criminal psychology. And she has a TikTok following of 65,000 people. And what she has done is she has dedicated her TikTok to be political takes and cultural takes from a conservative or Republican standpoint. So without further ado, I want to bring on Noelle. Noelle, thank you very much for joining me for this episode. I am very much looking forward to discussing with you Gen Z and the Republican Party and what can be done moving forward as it stands right now to bring more Gen Zers into the Republican Party. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be on. So my first question for you is... Why did you decide to dedicate your your TikTok to politics and and culture? <laughs> that seems like something I know I definitely wouldn't have done um, when I was in my twenties. And and yes, I'm that old. Everybody who's watching and listening, um, but I I don't I don't think I would have done that. So, well, honestly, it was kind of an accident. Um, I okay. wasn't, I didn't originally start with posting political content. I kind of started with more makeup and fashion. And then here and there, I would post more of the political takes that I do now. And I always got mm -hmm. a lot of really positive feedback from them. And those videos always ended up doing really well. So I kind of took that as a sign that this is the type of thing that people are wanting to see. So I started investing more time into doing a little bit more research and okay. staying up on current events and just reporting more on them. And people really seem to like that. And it's also very beneficial for me because it keeps me in the loop and keeps me educated as well. So definitely an accident, yeah. but I, I <laughs> love it. I definitely love it. It's a accidental passion that I've stumbled into. Yes, I'm glad you said the word passion, because when I describe my start with this podcast I, and how I consider my podcast now, I say a passion project of mine. Like that, That's how I refer to it. This is, this is a new passion of mine. I've had previous passions before, but I felt like this, this calling for me to get my voice out there, make my opinions known, and this is now my passion project. So with, with politics... Right before we started uh, filming this episode, I noticed I checked on checked on how many followers you had, and you're up to like sixty five thousand, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. Are those sixty five thousand people in agreement with you, or some of them trolls and haters? Like, what kind of, uh, I guess, mix do you do you feel like you have? And then, are there other influencers on TikTok that are talking about the same things you are that maybe you've kind of built a community uh, using yeah. TikTok? 
Yeah, um, I would definitely say the majority of my followers are mostly in agreement with me. There's definitely, definitely trolls out there on any social media platform. There's always going to be those people. But for the most part, it's a very supportive community I have found. And I've also definitely found that there are a select few other political influencers on the opposite side of the aisle who I get along with and can have conversations with. They are very few, <laughs> but they are out there. <laughs> um, as far as other influencers that like I've created a community with, there definitely, definitely are a couple who I am in pretty frequent contact with. And I think mm -hmm. that we all kind of look at each other's posts and take inspiration and see what each other is talking about and check out what different people are reporting on that day or what stories are circulating mm -hmm. or what jokes are circulating even and with this administration they're bountiful um right so it's always it's always very fun and it's always very not always very upbeat but for the most part i would definitely say it's a very supportive community okay awesome so um gen z and i said this in my my lead into this interview, Gen Z that's defined as 1997 through 2012. I'm a millennial Gen Y. Um, I was looking at some of the numbers Gen Z in this most recent election in, in 2020 accounted for 10% of the, the electorate, those, those who voted. Um, and Gen Z plus Gen Y, I believe equals about 30-ish, uh, 31% of the total voting body in the 2020 election. Um, Gen Z is obviously going to continue to grow because 97 to 2022 is like 25 years old. So the majority of the, um, the generation, so to speak, has of voters that didn't even hit 18 yet to start voting. So it is this growing, uh, cohort, the Democrat party, the Republican party, independents, and everyone are, are vying for to, to gain support of. So for you, um, do you feel, did you, is there anything that I guess brought you to where you are now from like a political viewpoints or have you always had these viewpoints? Is there anything maybe the GOP did or the previous administration with Trump did that kind of shaped your views or have you been on the conservative side of the Republican party uh, from the start? Yeah, so definitely not. Um, I would say from 16 to 20 ish I was definitely on the left side of the aisle I was very liberal um, I have a very conservative family so I couldn't explain to you how I came out liberal other than I went to public school and we all know who, how that tends to go um, that said I don't really think that I was very politically active I definitely held my beliefs that were left leaning but mm -hmm. I I just didn't care very much, but then in 2020, I started to notice the censorship, especially with the Save Our Children movement on Facebook. I started seeing how heavily censored that movement was, and it got me thinking, if they're censoring this, what the heck else are they censoring? And so I started right. looking more and more into it. And the more I looked into it, the more I realized that the things that I thought were true weren't necessarily true. And the people that I trust most in this world, which is my family, they're all conservative and they're all Republican. And so whenever I would have questions, I would ask them and they always had really well thought out, really accurate answers that I couldn't argue. I didn't have any leg to stand on with my left leaning beliefs so i just ended up uh -huh. doing more and more research and the further i dug the more conservative and the more right leaning i became more for sure right yeah and you and you hear the republican party saying the republican party wins on policies and the democrat party right now seems to be trying to win based on based on emotion um to to compel their voters and to, to mm -hmm. gain support but i so I read this article um, in preparation for our interview, and it is from the New York Post, which is <clears throat> a right-leaning publication. I think we're aware of that. But it was this editorial written by 
um, a Gen Zer, a college student up in NYU, and they they wrote this editorial, and they summarized it this way. And I'm, I'm going to read the quote. Quote: The GOP should work on rebranding as the modern, reasonable, solutions-oriented party. End quote. And then also in that editorial, uh, the NYU College Republican president was quoted saying, if I were a Republican strategist, I would concentrate on wokeness and PC, political correctness, craziness, and how the Republican Party is going to stand up to it. Not in a way that stifles free speech, there's that censorship, but in defense of basic morality and normalcy, end quote. Uh, what is your reaction to to those opinions from that editorial? Do you do you agree with that? Is that the the route that the GOP should go? Do you think they're already going down that path of being a solutions oriented party, a reasonable party, uh, not woke, not overly PC? Do you agree with those I, statements? Yes. And and should they add any any I guess other strategy to that? Yeah, I definitely definitely agree with that. Um, I think you're already seeing the GOP starting to shift from the traditional tax cut kind of campaign to the culture issues that we are seeing in our country today. I think that the Demo Democrats mm -hmm. are making a really crucial mistake by attacking parents right now. And I think that that is kind of the cohort that's going to be really shifting the tide at the moment. But as far as Gen Z goes, I think that they are currently seeing what their policies look like in practice. I think Gen Z is this mm -hmm. kind of generation that nobody really knows what to do with. They're all very <laughs> up in the air about pretty much everything. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that Gen Z, they, you know, they like instant gratification. They want answers fast. They want money fast. And like I said, they're seeing mm -hmm. these um, policies in action. And so that can go for anything like defunding the police to all of the uh, free money that the government has been giving out and the repercussions of this. You know, kids my age, we like to go out and it's really hard to go out when there are constant muggings and drinks are $17. So I think that, Ooh. yeah, I think that there is Man. definitely it's almost a taste of their own medicine. They like to preach mm -hmm. about all of these culture wars and these culture issues, but they're starting to see the real life implications of the policies that they claim to stand behind. And I think that in and of itself is going to create the red wave of Gen Z. Well, I certainly hope so. Um, one of my previous episodes, and I've now referenced this on a, on a couple of episodes after it. So I'll say it again. It's, I had this episode in this one take that there's a, my opinion, the fundamental flaw of, <clears throat> of progressivism, which it seems like a lot of the Democrat party is, is embracing because the, like the older Democrats, they say, you know, like the, I didn't move the party shifted. I didn't shift. Mm -hmm. The party continues to go left and farther left. And I, um, my opinion, the, the fundamental flaw of progressivism is that if you look at the definition of progress, progress is does not mean you are just moving like further down the track, further down the road. You know, progress means that there is improvement. And what the progressive wing of the Democrat Party, which seems to have taken hold of the Democrat Party, is doing is instead of making improvements, they are just continuing along. And ultimately, it's resulted in them falling off a cliff. Like you were saying, they're getting a taste of their own medicine right they've mm -hmm. they've gone too far we've seen them try to walk things back already like with defunding the police and other and other things they're trying to to shift blame over to the republican party for things that they clearly are responsible for and i really hope that a lot of gen z is taking notice of that because one of the statistics that i that i read and i also mentioned in the intro leading up to this to our interview our discussion is that Gen Z right now, they're 31% of Gen Zers that can are old enough to register to vote <clears throat> identify as Republican. 50, not, not quite 50, but the majority, like the largest percentage or group of Gen Zers identifies closer to an independent. 
Like, like you yeah. said, they're, no one really knows what to do with their Gen Zers. It seems like are trying to figure things out. So instead of picking one side or the other, they're saying independent. Maybe they're a little more uh, lenient, like with certain social issues, but they agree with uh, maybe like the capitalism of the Republican Party and so on and so forth. So is is that what you see? Is that kind of ref- what I read? Is that does that seem like it's accurate to you to where there could be like there could be maybe an independent wave or like a right leaning independent and maybe a uh, majority Republican for Gen Z in the future, or maybe something a little different. What's, what's your take? I, yeah, no, I definitely think so. I think that with COVID and with 2020 and the dramatic government overreach, I think that a lot of people have lost faith in both parties. And I think that that is why we are seeing this, really strong uprising of the independent party. Um, I personally, in my own life, anytime I have a conversation with somebody, they tend to agree with my stances and they tend to lean more right. They are just too afraid to say it. And that is one of the problems that we are facing right now is the left, although they are a small minority, they are extremely loud and they're extremely aggressive. And people who disagree with them get cudgeled into a corner and they get canceled. If you say the wrong thing, if you do the wrong thing, um, you're seeing it with uh, Dave, the Dave Chappelle scandal. I think that that was a really big eye opener for a lot of people in the way that the media kind of twists things. Because anyone who actually watched that special that I know knew that he didn't say anything slightly controversial. If anything, the special was pro trans and yet the media Mm -hmm. took that and spun it and cudgeled him and put him in a corner and tried to cancel him and i think that it was a good example of the way that people should be reacting because dave chappelle is by no means on the right but it's like you were saying earlier brian the party has moved so far left that people who are traditionally democrat or traditionally on the left are now Mm -hmm. being viewed as on the right. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm encouraged with, with what I've seen uh, as far as like the, the reaching out of, of the Republican party, the GOP, and also like the conservative uh, wing of the conserv of the Republican party, because I know there are some big organizations out there. There is, Turning Point USA, which their president and founder is Charlie Kirk, and he has a huge following in TPUSA, is all over high schools and college campuses. I believe there's about 3,000 chapters, I think is the terminology they use, 3,000 chapters or so. And then CPAC, the Conservative Political Action Committee, was here in Orlando where I am, uh, I think last month. And I see in photos from that a lot of a lot of the younger generation being politically active. I did not do that when I was in my twenties uh, going back. I, I guess it just, the times then or the times now kind of thing, maybe, I don't know, or maybe I was just too wrapped into to other stuff, but seeing those things does encourage me that, you know, there is a concerted effort to, uh, to, I don't want to say to, to gain or like, cause that makes it seem like we're trying, like trying to trick Gen Z, but showing like, Hey, this is what we're about from these organization standpoint, you know, yeah. if you're in agreement with us, you know, don't be shy, stand up, speak your truth. Your, I mean, your values stand up for truth. You know, we are all about free speech and individual rights and freedoms and so on and so forth. You know, don't be like you were just saying, don't feel like you're going to be, uh, don't be afraid to be chastised by those who may come and speak out against you. Like that's just, yeah the nature of the beast, I guess, for, for lack of a better term. So with your significant following that you have on, on TikTok, again, I think you're like a 65,000, which is, which is crazy to me. I hope to get there one day. Um, but what do you see yourself moving forward? Like, do you have an end goal on TikTok? Do you think you're always going to be, um, doing this or do you have like a goal in mind? Like, Hey, I'm going to run with this through 2022 or Hey, I'm going to 
keep hitting it every single day all the way through 2024 like see this through or are you just in it in it to win it for for forever until you are a a, a um a criminal psychologist or kind of what's the future for you noel yeah um great question i kind of <laughs> am just taking it day by day um mm -hmm. i try to be consistent and post at least once or twice a day but if i don't you no know, sweat off my back um I would obviously love to see my platform grow. Um, one of the most rewarding things is when I get, when people come to my Instagram and they'll DM me through Instagram, it feels like it's like this like secret mission. They'll message me and they're around my age and they'll just thank me for speaking up and saying the things that they're too afraid to say. And mm -hmm. as rewarding as it is, it also breaks my heart because you know, there's, there's power in numbers and, if we're going to turn the tides and we need more people to be speaking up. And I know for a fact that there are more people that agree with us than, mm -hmm. than don't. I, I see it. And it's just a matter of facing that fear and speaking up for what's, what's right. Yeah, that's, yeah. I like what you said there because when I, like talking about speaking for other other people and people thanking you. I know when I started this podcast just in, in May of last year, everything I kept saying is, and I'm thinking, I think I said in my first episode is, you know, I started this podcast because I wanted to put my voice out there, you know, speaking on behalf of myself. But for what I've learned over the previous 43 episode, 42 episodes is that that may have, may be how it started for me, but from the feedback I've gotten and the interactions I've had with people, I realize now that this passion project of mine, its greatest role is speaking on behalf of others who are too afraid to speak or, and maybe they never will, but they'll be sore. They just need a little bit of help, a little bit of encouragement. And like you said, like there's power in numbers. What I may say, what you may say could encourage these other people to be like, all right, you know, muster up the strength, so to speak, the bravery, the courage to, to finally put their, their beliefs out there and, and generate or not generate, but just finally start speaking up. And then it's like a, a domino effect or a ripple effect. Right. And that's the goal to, to make it normal and to experiencing when it comes to the, like the constant barrage of no, your way is wrong these personal attacks, like it's not just, mm -hmm. it's not p policy attacks, it's personal attacks, right? It's yeah. from, from the left or especially the, the more progressive, the progressive wing, it's, it's not political attacks, it's personal attacks, which is completely different. It does unfortunately keep a lot of people, a lot of people quiet. Most definitely. Um, that's one of the strangest things I think about and I want to say that it's majority Gen Z, especially Gen Z who are on the left, is because politics has become such a cultural thing. I mean, it's always been cultural, but over the last 20 years, it's really developed into that being the forefront. And mm -hmm. people have started intertwining their personal identity with their politics. And so when you are discussing policy or politics, they take it as an attack on themselves. And that's why you see these aggressive outbursts and these personal attacks. And it's like you said, you hit it on the nose. It's never, they never attack the policy. It's always on a personal level. Like when I, when I get leftists in my comments, it's always something personal. It's your voice is weird. It's your teeth are big. It's whatever it might be, but it's never on the content yeah. of the message. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it feels like a whole bunch of cheap shots, uh, in my opinion. <clears throat> and most all of them, and these people, right, especially when it comes to social media, they don't, they don't know you. They don't know me. They're just throwing stuff out there and, you know, throwing speaking, untruths and hate and just yelling and projecting whatever they're dealing with onto onto other people and it's and it seems to always be personal and it, it can get 
really nasty, <laughs> really nasty. Yeah. Um, so I want to, I want to kind of wrap up the interview with, with this question with everything that you have experienced and the success that you, that you have experienced and the, the courage that you have taken to dedicate an entire platform of yours to, to politics and, and everything. And obviously it's very successful. I mean, you're here, right? Like your content caught my attention and I saw that you had a way to get in touch with you. And I, you know, I made sure within the subject of that email saying like, love your content, be my guest. <laughs> and, um, and thankfully you, you know, you responded because I think this is, these are the conversations we need to have. We need to promote one another, right. Most to, definitely. to grow, um, to grow the base. So Noel, I'll, I'll ask you this last question. What, what is your message to your generation as we are now just about to be seven months away from the midterms, but what is your message to, to your generation? And I guess, is it, as it, uh, as it includes just politics in general, speaking up for what you believe in, you know, having courage, what is, what is your message to, to your generation here? I, I would say, take a look around take a hard reality check and look at the world around you. Look at the gas prices. Look at the price of your grocery shopping trip. Look at how you feel when there's a particular flag in your neighbor's yard. Why are these, why is that the feeling that is ignited? Like why are our emotions so closely intertwined into our politics. And if you're not happy with the way that things are going right now, which judging by the polls, very, 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 very few people are, what are the policies that are currently in place? Start looking into policy, let go of that emotional tie that we have to our political beliefs let go for one second of thinking about if we're right or wrong on one particular issue and really dive into the policies and the effects of these policies and if you don't like the direction that you see things going if you can't afford your rent anymore think about who is instituting those policies. And if you are more right-leaning and if you are conservative, I strongly urge everybody to just start speaking up. And I am seeing so many more people speaking up. So many Mm -hmm. of my politically neutral friends are speaking up because things are just getting so out of hand. And I always applaud them for doing that because it does take courage because the left is very cruel. I have lost a lot of friends because of my political beliefs. And that's another question Mm -hmm. to pose. If you're willing to stop being friends with somebody over politics, reevaluate a couple of things. Like there's, there's much more important things in the world. Um, Yeah. Take a, take a deep look inside, take a deep look around. Are you happy with the way things are going? Cause I know I'm not, so I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing and I'm going to keep speaking up and I'm going to keep being loud because the left is loud. So we got to be louder. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Oh man. That's a, well, that is a great message. Um, you might want to submit an application here for a part-time role within, <laughs> within the GOP, the strategist, or maybe go work for TP USA or something like that. I, don't know, not. But... <laughs> I get asked all the time when I'm running for office. The answer is never. Well, never say never. And never say when, never, if you do but... ever run for... <laughs> well, if, if you do happen to have like any political future, whether it's office or just being involved in an organization, volunteering or whatever, and when, it, when you do become big time, you can point right back to here being your first podcast ever. <laughs> and I will. Yes, I uh, can. Thank you. <laughs> I'll shout it from the rooftops, right? Uh, selfishly. <laughs> but, but Noel, you have been a, a fantastic guest. I really enjoyed this discussion. And please just remind everyone one more time and I'll put your, um, your information and everything in the show notes, but please just remind everyone once more where they can 
find you and, and contact you if need be, reach out to you, right? Engagement, it takes courage to speak out in this day and age. And when someone does speak out, we need to also encourage those individuals. And, and I know you already do that, but if you could just remind everyone uh, one more time how they, can, how they can follow you. And once again, thank you for joining me. Of course, you can always find me at Noelle Poulin on TikTok and Instagram. I'm very active on both of those platforms. I try to answer DMs when I get them. So it's pretty straightforward. Just my name on pretty much any platform, Twitter, what, what have you. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Noelle. Thank you, Brian. I really enjoyed that interview with Noelle. I think you would agree with me that she has a lot of great and valuable insight into what it's going to take to bring more Gen Z into the Republican Party. She mentioned we talked a lot about courage and the courage that it takes to to speak your voice when it comes to politics, because politics has, it seems like, has seeped into everything that we do, and it has become polarizing. I would say even more polarizing than than religion. They say right at work, you don't want to talk about you don't want to talk about politics or religion. Like you just you don't want to do that with your coworkers. And what I want to take from that interview is what she and I discussed about being courageous to put your voice out there. As Noel mentioned, she has had countless number of people DM her who won't comment, you know, on a video that she posts, but they'll DM her and say like, hey, I agree with you. Hey, thank you for speaking out. You know, I feel like I can't, but thank you for speaking for me. I am in agreement with you. And courage also needs encouragement, right? If someone does take that step, we need to be there as fellow conservatives or Republicans to encourage that person so they don't feel like they're out there all alone. One of the things that I've realized in the now 43 episodes of this podcast is that I said I was starting to speak through this podcast for myself. But what I have come to realize through my interactions with other people is that I am speaking for more than just myself. I am speaking for others who feel like they can't speak up or maybe they are timid and and don't want to speak up, but they agree and share my beliefs, like-minded people. So there is this greater sense through this platform that I have and then through what Noelle is doing on her, her TikTok that one of the ways to recruit more people, whether you are Gen Z, Gen Y, Gen X, baby boomer, whatever, is to increase in number by speaking, not to be afraid. Unfortunately, that's the term I feel like applies, right? Don't be afraid because you're going to get attacked personally. That's more more likely what's going to happen than any type of policy disagreement. It is just going to be attack, attack, attack. The more you put yourself out there, the more you speak up, especially if you are diving into uh, into like a, a post that is from, you know, the political left, you're just basically walking into the lion's den, right? But that's what it's going to take. It is going to take a concerted effort from individuals to bring more people into the Republican Party. It's going to take what Noel suggested looking around and then looking at what is cur- who is currently in power, not only in the White House, but the uh, Congress with the House of Representatives and the Senate, and asking yourself, are you really a fan of what's going on? Or did you like it how it was a couple of years ago? Or if you didn't like Trump, let's say, but you like the policies, then looking forward in 2022 and in 2024, are you going to jump over to the Republican Party because you believe in the policies of the Republican Party and not get sw- caught up and swept up in the emotional plea of the liberal left, the progressive left, which has resulted in so many, so many things gone wrong in just the year and a half of this Biden presidency. So my hope is... And my encouragement to you as a listener or a viewer 
is to, to speak up, to recruit others, to encourage them to embrace their political beliefs and to stand up for them in 2022 and 2024 and beyond. Thank you so much for joining me. Again, you can catch Counterthought on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, basically wherever you can listen to a podcast, any of those apps. And you can also catch the video versions on YouTube and Rumble.